I remember watching a, a program on BBC some years ago, and this is Professor Brian Cox. And uh, the program was about the Big Bang Theory. And I remember the program started with a black screen, just black screen, nothing on there. And there was just a voice saying, in the beginning, there was nothing. Well, clearly, this phrase in the beginning has been uh, taken from the Bible because this is the opening sentence of the Hebrew Bible, in the beginning. But it starts uh, in a different manner in the Bible. In the beginning, God, Bible says. And Brian Cox used this phrase, in the beginning, and then he tweaked and changed God to there was nothing. Now, when we look at these statements, although this has been stated by a, a, a scientist, renowned scientist, this is not really a scientific statement. Uh, in order to consider something scientific, you need to be able to present some evidence and perform some tests and demonstrate some results. But uh, what happened in the beginning? Uh, if there was nothing in the beginning, first thing, there were no eyewitnesses. Second, there was nothing to look at. Uh, there was nothing to test, nothing. There was nothing to experiment with. There was nothing to see, nothing to hear, nothing to touch. So it's hardly a scientific statement to say in the beginning there was nothing. And basically, it boils down to this. The underlying principle of this statement, in the beginning there was nothing. The underlying principle is that something came from nothing. If you look at the statement from the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God, and then he says, created. Underlying principle here is that something came from something or from someone. So, two things. Something came from nothing or something came from something. This is where uh, I discussed things uh, initially with my with my daughter and, and I asked her, what, what do you think? What makes more sense to you? Trying to be as fair as possible um, as a human being. And eventually she told me, well, it doesn't make sense to me that something came from nothing. And that was the, the basis of our conversation that we continued. So, let me try and present to you the three main perspectives on reality uh, that you can, you can have a look at from a scientific perspective, from a religious perspective. We just try to boil down three main perspectives on reality, life around us. And each perspective has a story to tell. The beginning, the middle, and the end. The beginning, the middle, and the conclusion. The origins of life, the life itself is the meaning of life, and then the death, end of life, and or afterlife, after that. So here we have, uh, let's start with Albert Einstein. Uh, and this is one of the statements he's made. I want to know how God created this world. I want to know his thoughts. The rest are details. Uh, when Einstein spoke about God. He did not believe in, in a personal God. He just believed there is something more than just atoms and molecules, material, matter of the universe. He believed there's something more to it. There's something behind it. Um, and I put this column under the title agnostic science because agnostic means I don't know or I'm not sure. And that's basically it. Einstein doesn't know who God is or what God is or or how it is, but he is not a materialist. He believes there is something more to it than just uh, material in this universe. On the other hand, we have a look at a uh, column on this size, atheistic science. Here we have Stephen Hawking and one quote for him. Before we understand science, it is natural to believe that God created the universe. But now science offers a more convincing explanation. We would know everything that God would know if there 
there a God which there isn't. I'm an atheist. So unlike Albert Einstein, who was not a materialist, an atheist, Stephen Hawking claimed that he was an atheist. The universe, uh, the material universe is all there is. There is nothing more to it. And, uh, and that's it. Now in the middle column, we have Isaac Newton. So we have sort of three key scientific personas from our relatively modern times. And um, I put number 2060 there because, uh, in fact, Isaac Newton, though famous for uh, being, being a, a mathematician, and physicist, and so forth, he actually wrote more about uh, the Bible, and specifically Bible prophecies, than he wrote about physics and maths. And uh, his book, entitled Observations on the Prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, uh, he felt strongly compelled to figure out what's going on in the biblical prophecies. And to cut the story short, he basically concluded that the history of this world would come to an end in the year 2060. If you want to figure out all the details, you can read his book, Observations on Daniel and Prophecies of Daniel and Apocalypse or Revelation. Well, those of us who are still around at, uh, in the year 2060, we will see whether he was right or wrong. In terms of uh, science, maths and physics, nobody will question really Isaac Newton. He was a clever guy. And because of him, we can send rockets to space. Uh, he calculated everything very precisely. Whether he calculated the biblical prophecies precisely, whether he understood the real meaning of the message from the Bible, that's, that's a different story, different matter. But he, he was a theistic scientist. He believed in, in a personal God who created this universe. And he believed that he was enlightened by this God. He, he didn't say, I have figured out all these things by myself. He believed that God, through his spirit, has enlightened his mind and understanding to see things, to comprehend things, to understand things, to be able to explain things. So here we have three basic columns, agnostic science on one side, atheistic science on the other side. Atheistic science, which is purely materialistic, agnostic science, which allows for something more than purely materialistic, and theistic science, which studies the materialistic material universe, but it also acknowledges there is something more to it. There is a spiritual uh, aspect of reality. Uh, there is a spiritual realm. And God is a part of this realm. So, how would we view God in, in each perspective column, in each perspective on reality? Uh, clearly, in, in, in the atheistic science, it's, it's very direct. It's very easy to comprehend. God does not exist. As simple as that. Agnostic science, uh, well, it will never say that there is no God. It will not say that the God doesn't exist. Uh, as far as Albert Einstein is concerned, he did mention the word God and, and some kind of mind or intelligence or, or understanding. But for him, uh, God was more of an impersonal mind or being. Or It's a bit... It's a bit uh, akin to some of the Eastern religions, uh, specifically uh, Buddhism, um, where there is this sort of impersonal spirit, impersonal mind that's always been there and that's the ultimate reality. And in the middle column, theistic science, we have God as a person, specifically as the creator who created this universe in the beginning. Now, a very important thing to point out is that all these things are based on belief rather than on evidence. Therefore, at this point, it's all religion, uh, not science. When you speak about God, it's very difficult to prove or disprove anything. And when you talk about, similarly, when you talk about the origins or beginnings of the universe and life, there is no, there is no ultimate or, or um, absolute evidence to confirm or deny one or the other or the third. So here it 
speak in terms of speculation, scientifically speaking, or in terms of faith, religiously speaking, but let's call it all religion rather than science at this point. So, atheistic science will call matter religion because it's materialism or materialism, materialistic religion. Agnostic science, we will allow for something more than materialism, so we call it spirit religion. And in the middle, we have theistic science, which can be, which combines both spirit and matter as essential aspects of reality. So we can call it spirit and matter religion. So what is the ultimate nature of reality? And that answers also the question, what is our eternal destiny? Each perspective, each of the three main perspectives on reality, tells a different story, starting with the origins, then following its logical narrative through the middle, concluding at the end. So, let's have a look at it. Uh, spirit religion, matter religion or materialism, and then spirit and matter in the middle of theism. Uh, in spirit religion, spirit or mind is eternal. There is this eternal mind, which is the ultimate reality. There is no beginning to it and no end to it. And perhaps if you look at some religions, they even consider this universe to be eternal. It doesn't have a beginning. Yes. So there is no beginning. Um, materialism or matter religion says that matter was created in the beginning, out of nothing. There was nothing and then suddenly there was matter, there was universe. Spirit or mind does not exist. So if you think about these terms, spirit or mind, they're just in this column, we only have brain because brain is made of matter. So there is no spirit or mind, just the brain and its biochemical processes. In the middle column, spirit and matter religion, this corresponds to theism, we have both spirit or mind and matter were created in the beginning. They're not eternal, neither is the universe eternal. So in this first column, when you look at the origins, it's actually materialism and theism or matter and spirit and matter religion that agree because they both have a beginning. There is the beginning. There is nothing that we see around us that existed since eternity, yeah? Everything started in the beginning. Obviously, in spirit and matter religion, there is a creator who is eternal, but everything else has a beginning. Whereas the spirit religion, uh, it, it tells us there is no beginning. There is no beginning. Uh, the spirit or mind is eternal. It's the ultimate reality. Then if you move forward from the origins, from the beginning into the middle, which is life. In uh, matter religion or materialism, it's very direct again, very clear. There is no purpose to life. There is no design to life, no purpose to life. Don't waste your time thinking about it. Just get on with it and stop complaining. As simple as that. Just live this life. There is no purpose to it. Forget about it. Make of it what you want. In spirit religion, purpose of life is obviously focused on the spirit because that's the ultimate reality. Just like in the matter religion, materialism, matter is the ultimate reality. So when you die, there's nothing there. So live this life now and that's it. In spirit religion, spirit is the ultimate reality, not matter. So the purpose of life is to escape from matter, to escape from the prison of body, physical, material body, and to release the spirit or the mind into a non-material, non-personal realm, eventually to join this great ultimate reality of, of the mind of the universe or the spirit of the universe. In the middle column, spirit and matter or theism, spirit and matter religion, the purpose of life is very uh, distinct because you have the creator, personal creator, a person to whom you can relate. So from the beginning, the purpose of life involves the relationships. Uh, the purpose of life is to relate to personal God and it extends to other relationships also. And then you move towards the end of the story. So you have the origins of the beginning, you have life or purpose of life and then the end of life and or afterlife or not. In the matter religion or materialism, physical death or death is the end of the person, it's the end of life. 
When the brain dies, there is no mind, there is no spirit. When the brain dies, it decomposes back into the molecules and atoms. There is, there is nothing else left of you. This is the end of the person. The person is destroyed. You do not exist anymore as a person. That's it. Interestingly, in the spirit religion, even though the, that is not the end, it still is the end of the person, just like in materialism. Physical death is the end of the person because once you die, your spirit or your soul fuses into the eternal, impersonal mind or being or spirit. And this is not you anymore. This is some something else. It's spirit. There is no there is no memories of you. There is no your characteristics, your character, your person. The person is gone. The person is dead, gone forever. So in both spirit and matter religions, once you die, you are gone forever. You as the person are gone forever. That's it. You do not exist anymore. And you have you are forgotten and and you're gone. Whereas in the middle column, in spirit and matter religion, we have physical death that is followed by judgment or evaluation and then physical resurrection or new creation. And this is all done by this personal creator who started everything in the beginning. So after you physically die, the person is not destroyed like in materialism. The person is not gone like in the spiritual religions. The person, you are still there and you come back to life. You come to judgment and, and you as the person, it's you, your characteristics, your, your person, you, you, it's real you who, who can come and face the creator and has a possibility to live forever as the person, as you know yourself, with your characteristics, with your person, personality, with you, you. This is the only column, spirit and matter religion, where you can, you have a possibility to live forever. You as a person, as you know yourself. So, matter religion, we can call it materialism. Spirit religion, we can call it spirit. Ism, not spiritism, that's something else, but spiritism. And spirit and matter religion is intermingled. It incorporates both matter, matter and spirit as essential aspects of reality. And uh, I put uh, this statement, physical death, followed by physical resurrection in green here, because for me, this is the only way forward. If, if you, you, the personal you, you as a person with your own characteristics, with you, who you truly are, your essence, if you want to live forever, you know, this is the only way, the only possibility for you as a person to live forever. So what do we, what do we have here? Once we come to the end of life, what do we do? In the matter religion, if you look at some scientists who are atheists like Stephen Hawking, he believed when he died, there is nothing left of him, he's forever gone. So. Yeah, he's gone. He can't help you here. He's gone. He's not around anymore. If you look at the spirit religion, scientists like Einstein, who was sort of an agnostic and fits sort of in this column, he's gone. He can't help you. He, he spent his dying hours on, on the deathbed, frantically writing out equations, trying to figure out the deeper secrets of the universe. But then once he died, but that's it. That's the end of his life, and he's gone, and, and he's not here to tell us or help us anything. Uh, Buddha. Buddha is gone. He can't help you either. If you look in the middle column, spirit and matter religion. Now, this is very specific, because what fits in this column is what we call Abrahamic religions. Abrahamic religions. Starting with Judaism or Hebrew religion, then Christianity, and then Islam. All these come from Abraham, and all these incorporate spirit and matter together as essential aspects of reality. We have physical death. It's followed by physical resurrection. You're not judged as 
as a spirit, but you are raised back to life in a physical body to face the Creator, to face God. And uh, what happens after that? Well, that's that's the discussion for a for a different time. So the person is still there in this religion. This is the only way for us. If you want to know, if if you want to have chance of living after you die, the only way forward, you as a person, if you want to remember yourself, if you want to know who you are, to live forever as you are, with your characteristics, this is the only way forward. Physical death followed by physical resurrection. Now, is there any evidence pointing to the true nature of reality? Again, when you talk about origins, there is no evidence. What happened in the beginning? Scientists say in the beginning there was nothing. There is no way to prove or disprove that. There is no eyewitnesses. There is no experiments, no tests, no lab. Uh, tests performed. There is nothing to see, nothing to smell, nothing to touch. There is nothing there. It's not really science. Uh, same for all the columns. Origins. There is there's no evidence. You have to take it by faith or religion or speculation whichever way you would like to put it. When you come to the meaning of life, uh, again, it's a, it can be a tricky discussion. When you come to the end of life, now this is interesting because in the middle, col middle column, there is some something that could be considered evidence. There is only one instance where there is some historical verifiable evidence and not regarding the beginning of things in the beginning, the origins, the beginning of life, but regarding the end of life. There is only one person who gave some evidence regarding what happens after we die. And he came back after he died to tell us what happens after we die. And his claims are supported by the most attested ancient historical document, the New Testament, which is based on the accounts given by eyewitnesses and it's written by eyewitnesses. And uh, let me read a statement from the Gospel of Luke. Now, the Gospel of Luke is a very interesting gospel. Uh, most scholars or theologians in the higher institutions, some of them believe in God, some of them don't believe in God, they still study the Bible and scriptures, but they study it as literature, simply as human literature. But most of them, whether they believe in God or not, most of them agree that Luke is a historian. His gospel is unique, it's very specific. He approaches uh, the story of Christ from sort of uh, forensic, scientific perspective. And, uh, and this is how he, he he begins his gospel, and most scholars recognize that this is uh, a piece of history. Take it as it is, or not, it's up to you. Many have un undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses. So, first step in his investigation is to contact the eyewitnesses. Uh, step two, and servants of the world. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. So, Luke has investigated carefully uh, the statements of the eyewitnesses, uh, the written documents related to the what's written in the New Testament. He's carefully investigated everything from the beginning. It seemed good also to me to write an orderly account, orderly account, that's a systematic account based on eyewitnesses and careful forensic investigation. An orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, Luke could have, could have said, so that you may believe, like John, for instance, says in his gospel, that you may believe he could have said that you may believe this religion of Christianity, but no, that's not what he's saying. He says so that you may know, that you may know, he's talking about rational uh, investigation, that you may know the certainty, that you may know the certainty, not that you may believe uh, the religion, but that you may know the certainty. So step one, Luke uh, is looking for eyewitnesses, he's doing careful investigation, uh, uh, 
interviewing the eyewitnesses, looking at the evidence, uh, the written evidence, the spoken evidence. He's organizing all the information systematically in an orderly account to conclude that this is certainty. He is talking about historical facts and events, not uh, not some kind of religion or beliefs. This is the Gospel of Luke. So, what kind of things would have Luke investigated? Well, let me give you an example. The Apostle Paul, another uh, key witness of uh, Christ and uh, early Christian religion, says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 6, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. He came back to life in his body on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. These are his close friends. But then after that, he appeared to more than 500, more than 500 people, more than 500 of the brothers at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now, if you, if you read some writers like Sigmund Freud, he tried to explain this uh, event as, as sort of mass hallucination. Uh, more than 500 people at the same time, not at different times, at the same time have seen Christ after he died and he came back in a physical body, back from the dead. If you're on some medication, I know you can have hallucinations. If you have a reaction to some medications, it's an individual, you can have hallucinations. Uh, I know some people who hallucinated because of they're taking some medicine uh, to stop it. But to think that it is 2000 years ago, there are 500 people who have participated in some uh, study of some uh, chemical drug all at the same time, and they all reacted the same way. They all hallucinated in the same way. They all say, saw the same thing. That's a bit far-fetched for me. What we hear and see here, that there is more than 500 people at one, at the same time, on one occasion, have seen Christ, who was dead, and now they see him walk and talk to them in a the physical body. So this is a kind of thing that Luke was investigating. And... Some of these people, these 500, he has probably uh, faced and interviewed and compared and contrasted their accounts just to make sure there's no fake news, fake stories, studied everything uh, diligently and carefully. And based on that and some other accounts, he wrote his gospel. But then, yes, you can say it is specifically the gospel of Luke. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a historical account. It's, it's, uh, it's written by a historian. It's based on, uh, on, on, um, on evidence and on live witnesses. But why would, why would anybody believe that? I mean, it's still 2000 years old and it's just, it's just, uh, it's just a book like any other book. Why would, why would anybody take it seriously? Really? Well, there's something very peculiar about the New Testament. Something very special, in fact, about the New Testament in terms of its preservation and accuracy. And here we have a column showing some of the ancient, well-known ancient documents. And, uh, for instance, Plato and Aristotle, Greek philosophers, Herodotus, Greek historian, Caesar, uh, Roman Caesar, I think he wrote uh, Caesar's Wars. Uh, Homer, that's the oldest one, Homer, who wrote Iliad and Odyssey. And uh, the first column tells us when, when this person lived and when, when they wrote what they wrote. The second column tells us when the earliest copy is found. So that gives us, uh, the first two columns give, give us a range of the time. Since the time of writing to the time of the first found manuscript. How long has it passed? And then we have the time between the original and the copy. And then we have number of copies and accuracy of copies. Uh, for Plato, who lived in the fourth century BC, the earliest copy of a manuscript that we have is AD 
900 or C900. Uh, so there is 1200 years uh, time lapse between the time when he wrote and the time when we have the first manuscript we can check. So 1200 years is a long time. How do you know that Plato, who lived 1200 years before this manuscript was found, how do you know that he actually wrote these things and he wrote them exactly as they were written? In over a thousand years, a lot of things could have gone wrong. Somebody may have spilled some coffee or or, or uh, something on the manuscript, may have rubbed it and and lost, may have lost some letters and and rewritten it in a slightly different way. And then it could be rewritten five, ten times and lost some original intent of the author. So that's the issue, really. Uh, Herodotus, same, similar thing. Fifth century BC, AD 900, roughly. Just giving you rough, rough dates in terms of centuries, not specific years. 1300 years, roughly. Not many copies, eight copies, like Plato, seven copies. So you can't really do any serious study on that. Uh, Caesar, thousand years since the time he wrote and the time we have the first manuscript. A lot could have happened in a thousand years. Aristotle, he's very important because Aristotle's writings are the basis of the modern scientific uh, reality, modern scientific world. It's pretty much all based on Aristotle's writings. Again, 4th century BC, somewhere roughly around AD 1000, roughly around that time, about 1300 years, roughly. A lot could have happened in 1300 years. How do you know that that's what Aristotle wrote exactly? How do you know it's not been corrupted or changed in 1300 years? It's a long time. We do have a little bit more copies of Aristotle. There is about almost 50. And uh, still, that's, that's what you get. Homer. Uh, is a bit better, even though he's the oldest author, almost a thousand years before B BC, at the time when David and Solomon lived, from the biblical times. Earliest copy is quite actually old, it's, it's, it's about 300 BC or BCE. And the time between original copy is not over a thousand years now, it's about 600 years, roughly about six centuries, not exactly roughly. That's a bit better than 1200 years, it's twice as Twice as good, but still, it's it's a six centuries is a long time. Things can happen in six centuries. Somebody could have changed something, rewritten something, adapted something, adjusted something, and nobody would know because we don't have any eyewitnesses. Six hundred years after Homer wrote, and that's the first, the oldest manuscripts we have of Homer. Now, num number of copies of Homer, we've got six, or over 600, so that's quite good. Because there is so much uh, stuff with Homer there, you can actually, uh, you can actually do some uh, meaningful comparisons there. And when you compare all the manuscripts found, the accuracy of the copies is 95%. That means if you read the first chapter of Iliad, 95% of the things in one, cop in one manuscript is identical to the other manuscript. But 5% is different. The story doesn't really align the 5% differences between uh, certain manuscripts. Plato, Aristotle, Herodotus, Homer, Caesar, we have all these writings. Nobody questions them. Nobody questions any of these writings. Everybody accepts that these are written by all these authors. These are genuine. They're true. Uh, nobody rejects them. Nobody questions them. But then when you come to the New Testament, there is a lot of enmity. Uh, rejection of the New Testament as some kind of uh, fictional invention. And if you look at the evidence from the manuscripts, it's significantly different to, to all of the previous ancient documents. Uh, New Testament was written in, in, the, in the first century, our era, somewhere between uh, year 50 and 100. AD or C. The earliest copy we have is from the second century AD, specifically between the year 100 and 150 AD. And this is a copy of a fragment from the Gospel of John. And most traditional scholars, conservative scholars at least, agree that John was the oldest living apostle and that he wrote towards the end of the first century somewhere in the 90s, 
uh, in the 90s AD. So basically, when John wrote uh, his gospel and other books, towards the end of the first century, there are people who were alive when he wrote it. There are people who knew him. And they would still be alive between 100 and 150 AD, and even after that. And if somebody claims that John wrote this, and we have the manuscript in, in the years between 100, 150 AD, roughly, and these people who knew John, who are still alive, maybe good friends of John, or friends of friends of John, they could have checked the manuscript and said, no, no, I know John. He didn't write this. This is nonsense. That's not John. But that's the whole point here. Compared to all the other ancient documents, we actually have now the eyewitnesses, living witnesses who knew the author, who could testify and say, this is nonsense, this is rubbish, this is forgery, this is not real. So we have, we have this unique situation in the New Testament. Less than 100 years, probably less than that, but I'll just stick with 100 years. It's probably 50 years, maybe different. But less than 100 years from the time we have a first, uh, from the time when the, when the author wrote, for instance, John, the apostle, and the time we have a first copy. And in these 50 to 100 years, we have people, living witnesses who knew John, who could check his writings and say that this is genuine or not. Number of copies, look at this, over 5,800 5, Greek manuscripts, Greek New Testament manuscripts we have. There are manuscripts in other languages, but just take me the Greek ones. And all these manuscripts are found in, in some of the key, key places uh, where the Christian religion began. So in, in the Middle East, in, in places like Antioch, in, in, in Syria, then in Africa, places like Alexandria, that was one of the key centers, Christians, Christianity, and then in, in the modern Europe, uh, in places like uh, like Rome, modern Italy, modern France, Spain. So all these places, they had Greek manuscripts, they copied them. And um, remember, in those days, we didn't have planes, trains, and automobiles. You couldn't just travel and chat with people over there and compare your notes. There was no internet. Uh, basically, people in the area where they lived, they sort of created their own tradition and they copied scriptures and manuscripts in, in, in their own uh, little settings. There was not much comparison going on in those days. So, so there'll be slight differences there between people who copied in, in Europe, in, 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 in Asia Minor, and in Africa. But the absolutely amazing thing is that when you look at the accuracy of the copies, over 5,800 copies from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, the accuracy of copies is 99.5%. 99.5%. That's incredible. It's amazing. It's, it's coming close to the standards of the modern scientific verification. And uh, to think that less than 0.5% of all these 6,000 manuscripts roughly 6,000. If you compare them all from all these different territories, there's less than 0.5% disagreement. That kind of accuracy from an ancient document, 2,000 years old, it's incredible, oh, almost miraculous. It just doesn't exist in any other ancient manuscript. So to say that New Testament is some kind of uh, created fiction, it's, it's, it's highly unlikely highly unlikely. It's mostly attested, mostly accurately attested ancient historic document, the New Testament. So parts of the New Testament have been preserved in more manuscripts than any other ancient work, having over 5,800 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts. And they keep finding new manuscripts uh, each year, each decade. Then there is also, we didn't even consider, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, almost 10,000 manuscripts in other languages like Syriac, Slavic, Gothic, Ethiopic, Coptic, Armenian, and more so. 25,000 plus and keep rising. So this is what we have with the New Testament. It's a serious stuff, serious, seriously attested document. So basically, we go back now 
after we consider what kind of document is talking to us about what happens after we die. Physical death followed by physical resurrection. Christ, who was killed on the cross, was buried, and he came back to life in his body with scars from crucifixion. And he was walking, and he was eating fish and bread, and he was talking to his friends, and he was talking to more than 500 eyewitnesses after he died and came back to life. That is the account that we found in the New Testament. And that is the perspective of reality that comes from this intermingled religion, where Christ doesn't ascend to, to, to heaven as a spirit. He doesn't go into some spiritual realm. Neither is he destroyed into atoms and molecules, but both as spirit and body, he comes back to life. Spirit and matter religion intermingled, and he is alive. And he's still alive, living, living forever into eternity. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand, Paul tells us. By this gospel, you are saved. So through this, what I write, you, you as a person, you as an individual, with your characteristics, with your personality, you have a chance of living forever, eternally. You are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more, more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep or are dead. This is it. If you, as a person, as individual, would like to have a chance to live forever, not to be destroyed when you die, not for your person to be destroyed and some kind of spirit goes into eternal realm, but you're still, you're still destroyed as a person, the only way for you to live forever as a person, as you know yourself, as individual, is through Jesus Christ, who died, was resurrected, and has promised to each one of us that at the end of the age, through judgment and resurrection, we will have a chance as individuals, as persons, to live forever together with him. Thank you, and God bless you.